So it's no secret that over the years that Formula 1 has been running, there have been teams with a lot of money, and there's been teams without a lot of money. But have the rules ever been changed with subtle undertones of, go away, we don't want you? Well, that's thought to be the case when Tyrrell was kicked out of the 1984 championship for trying to expose a loophole regarding weight limits. So in the 1980s, Formula 1 was on the edge of becoming the global juggernaut that it is today. Or to put it into words that Russell Brand might use, it was on the precipice of the zenith of immortality. So the sport was pretty much truly global at this point. There was a race on every continent on Earth. Well, except Antarctica, obviously, because I don't think there's much market for a street circuit at McMurdo Station. Don't get ideas, Stefano. You had Lauda and Prost, you had Mansell, you had Patrese, you had Alboreto, Arnoux, and an emerging Sao Paulo taxi driver that didn't like women, to quote Nelson Piquet, who was driving for the Tolman team, which would later become Benetton, Renault, Lotus, Renault, and now Alpine. Something about a plan? I, I don't know, it's another one of these forced memes that's just been run into the ground. And most importantly, Formula One was in the midst of its first turbo era. Well, technically only turbo era since these newer cars are turbo hybrids. Now, contrary to popular belief, not all of these engines hit the 1400 horsepower mark, a number that seems to increase by about 100 horsepower or so every five years as the Mandela effect gets bigger and bigger. And while the engines could put out that much power, they could only do so for really about two laps or so before they turn into the world's fastest hand grenades. And it's the BMW inline four that's put up on that pedestal of being, you know, a 1600 horsepower monster. It was pumping out something in the region of about five and a half bar of boost, which is 80 PSI or so. That's five and a half times atmospheric pressure at sea level. That's a lot of pressure being forced through a one and a half litre engine. But as with every new technology, these engines were expensive. And when they first appeared in the late 1970s, they were unreliable and as thirsty as a teenage boy discovering girls for the first time. If you were McLaren, Brabham, Ferrari or Renault with tobacco money coming out of your arseholes or having a car manufacturer footing the bill, these engines were disposable. I mean, literally, in the case of Brabham, they'd run the engine for two laps, lob it in the bin, put a race-ready engine in as well. And they even had gearboxes for qualifying to handle that 1600 horsepower or whatever number we're plucking out of our asses this week and then you know, run a normal one for the race. But if you were lower down the grid, then these engines were as valuable as gold-pressed latinum. If one of them blew up, you were screwed. And teams were spending big money on these engines purely to be competitive. Teams like AGS and Acela and all of that stuff. But there was one British team that was truly struggling and couldn't get hold of one of these turbo engines. And that was Tyrrell. Ken Tyrrell had been around since the late 1960s in Formula 1, initially running Matra chassis and then building his own, and in the process he won three drivers titles with Jackie Stewart. Now as a bonus fact, the Matra that won the Constructors title in 1969 nice, is the only car other than Ferrari that has won the Constructors title to be built outside of the UK. So with the exception of the US Grand Prix in Detroit, Tyrrell was the only team on the grid because there was a team called Spirit just running one race at Detroit. They were the only team on the grid running the legendary Cosworth DFV engine, or DFY engine as it was, because they'd, you know, done some updates to it. But, you know, the, the concept of the engine remains pretty much the same. Having an engine like this did have its advantages, though. It was lighter, and at the rain-soaked Monaco Grand Prix, Stefan Beloff made use of the better traction the car had, thanks to the lack of power, to finish third behind Prost and Senna as the race was abandoned. He even stuck an overtake on Nicky Lauda, of all people. But the issue was, Tyrrell was playing a dangerous game with the rulebook. Because this V8 was so light, they had to make sure it met the minimum weight requirements. And because turbos were a lot heavier, they didn't have to ballast as much. Tyrrell would have to find something in the region of 50 kilos from somewhere. And they weren't the only team to have a crack at this hole in the rulebook, because Brabham and Williams had been playing with something called the water cooled brakes. What they'd do is fill the car up with water to make sure it was kosher prior to the start of the race, then as the race went on, the water would fall out of the car, making it lighter and making it run underweight, but the FIA couldn't weigh it when it's on the track, and then the teams would claim that this water being sprayed all over the track was to cool the brakes. When the car came in for its final stop of the afternoon, or even after the race, Williams and Brabham or whoever would just fill the water back up so the car was nice and heavy so when it was weighed, it was all kosher. Now, this is probably why Park Ferme exists now. The FIA couldn't do anything about it. They were able to just walk up to the car and just fill it up with water. The Tyrrells of Brundle and Beloff had a water injection system built in. Now, this isn't actually a clever hack. This is 
know, a common thing. It uses water to cool the cylinders and therefore increase power. But it also allowed the car to start the race 40 kilograms under the legal limit. I actually can't find out how they dodged that rule, but because of this, the Tyrrells would be starting at 500 kilos there or thereabouts, while everybody else was starting around the 450 kilo minimum. And that's mad figures to be sending out because this year in 2022, the cars that are coming into service now will be starting races at nearly 900 kilos or above 900 kilos. But whatever Tyrrell was doing, it was working, because in Brazil, Brundle was fifth. In Belgium, Belov was 6th and with the fastest lap, and there was obviously Monte Carlo where Belov managed to finish 3rd. But then there was Detroit. The race was a race of attrition. Only 6 cars finished so everybody who finished would score points, and PK was the eventual winner. The Brundle in the uncompetitive naturally aspirated should have been near the back of the grid Tyrrell was actually 2nd, finishing only a few car lengths behind the eventual winner PK in the Brabham might have had something to do with the fact that at Detroit, engine power didn't matter. Just like Monaco. But after the race, a protest reached the stewards, and Tyrrell was under investigation. It must be said at this point, Tyrrell had already been under investigation once already following the Brazilian Grand Prix. Arrows had filed a protest saying that the Tyrrells had been refuelling, but the protest was thrown out by the FIA. But on this occasion, the officials had been notified of some grey balls that had been found in the pit lane. The FIA also found some impurities in the water injection system. They found some lead balls in the bag that held the water, and they took some samples and sent them to France and also somewhere in Texas to run some tests. When the results came back, they found that there were enough chemicals, 27.5% extra in fact, in the water to constitute an extra fuel source, as well as the fact that Tyrrell was using lead shot to add extra weight so the car was legal once it had finished the race. What had happened was, when the water went back in at the pit stop, some of the lead shot, approximately £140 worth that they put in, escaped through the vent on the tank and basically turned the Tyrrell 012 into the world's fastest shotgun. While Brundle was praised for his performance on that day by the event organisers, the FIA wasn't so happy. They disqualified Tyrrell from the race in Detroit, as well as all the races that they'd already raced in, including Monaco where Beloff had taken that podium, stripped them of the 13 points they'd already accumulated over the course of that season, and then kicked them out of the championship. But there's a little bit of an extra twist. Under appeal, the FIA retested the chemicals that they found in the water, and it came back at only 1%, which is a lot lower than 275 or whatever the hell it was, so it was actually well within the rules regarding extra chemicalage in the system. And Tyrrell also argued that the lead shot contained within that bag could only be removed by using tools, like it says in the rulebook, but the FIA just changed the charges instead. The charges were changed to, number one, fuel in the water, number two, unsecured ballast, Okay, they might have a point with that one. And number three, illegal holes in the bottom of the car, in violation of flat bottom rules designed to eliminate ground effect. This is one of the reasons why people think it was all a ruse just to kick them out so that it was all turbo cars on the grid, but there are some extra factors to consider here. Tyrrell was already getting screwed as they were banned for three races, but despite this, the FIA still imposed fines on them no showing for these races despite the fact that they were not allowed to be there anyway which is a bit like having a go at somebody for not going to your wedding, even though you never invited them to start with. In addition, with Tyrrell now not officially part of the championship, it meant that the other teams could vote on turbo-friendly rule changes without Tyrrell voting against, because Tyrrell being the only naturally aspirated team left, they could vote against and that would screw the whole thing up. The voting had to be unanimous. So get rid of the only team that's going to vote against the rule changes, and they can just pass them through left, right and centre with no opposition. People also accused the FIA of screwing with Tyrrell deliberately to make sure it was all turbo grid so that it could get better sponsorship and more input from the motoring manufacturers that were going towards turbo cars during the 80s. They wanted more people in like Mercedes, VW, some of the people that were running in Group B at the time, like Audi and Lancia and stuff like that. Oh yeah, they had some, they had some big dreams. But they also brought in a rule for 1986 saying it would be turbo only. That rule was only in place for one year. In 1987, they allowed naturally aspirated engines again, and then at the end of 1988, ditched the turbos entirely. So from 1989 all the way up until 2014, you can have a naturally aspirated engine again. 
And funnily enough, the year that they ditched turbos entirely, 1989, was the year that they had an unprecedented number of entries. Coincidence? Yeah, probably. Tyrrell switched to Renault turbos midway through 1985, meaning that the DFV's lifespan had come to a close after nearly 20 years of service, and Tyrrell must have been mighty annoyed at the FIA reverting back to allowing non-turbos for 1987. But to add to Tyrrell's misery, Beloff would be killed trying to overtake Jackie Ix at Eau Rouge at the 1985 1000km of Spa. If Tyrrell could have offloaded Beloff to another team, you know, buying out his contract and stuff like that, the money could have helped Tyrrell even further. Tyrrell struggled on through into the 90s with the odd flurry of success, if you want to call it that, getting podiums and that kind of thing, with Tyrrell's final season coming in 1998. Ken quit his own team in 1998 after the team hired pay driver Ricardo Tossa Rossett when Ken wanted the more experienced Jos Verstappen instead. The team later became BAR in 1999, Honda in 2006, Braun in 2009, and then Mercedes in 2010. So then, a look at the Tyrrell lead shot controversy from 1984. If you've learned something here today, then be sure to give the video a like, and if you want more like this or anything else I do here on this channel, be sure to subscribe and get Le Bell on so you never miss out on you know, any, any of it, really. Massive thank you, as ever, to the kind folk who support the channel via Patreon, and if you want to help support me at a more personal level like these legends, links to Patreon as well as Discord and my socials will be down in the description. So until next time, I've been Aidan Milward, have a great day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. So until then, goodbye.